we've got Dr. Brendan Clark, we've got Dr. Connor Brady, and me, Hello. my name's Nick Thompson. And we're just going to jump straight into it because we've been discussing and we, we've realized that we've opened a massive, massive, massive can of worms here. So, uh, Connor, I think you wanted to kick off. I do, yeah. We're going to get straight before we <laughs> get really. While we, yeah, while I absolutely appreciate the fact that we said we were going to get straight into it because we do need 45 <laughs> minutes for this, I do there want to say, there um, we go. I do want to say two things. First of all, thanks to the guys on Patreon. Uh, that's really been helping. Thanks to Nick for uh, fielding a lot of the questions there last week. It's been extremely busy uh, since we kind of sent people that way. So we appreciate everybody over there. That's where you yeah. get. Patreon people, you're great. Thank you very much. We're gonna we're gonna look after you as as, as well as we possibly can. Yeah, and, Brent, on that note, Connor just can't cope. <laughs> He's frozen. <laughs> <laughs> it's always going to be the way. So we're going to quickly just say, look, uh, thank you to Paleo Ridge, who've been great supporters uh, of us over the last month, two months. Um, and, you know, they, uh, you know, for all of you guys, if you want to just at least pay them a visit on their website, see what they do. Uh, thanks to them. Um, you know, they've been a great help to us setting up and doing more uh, for you going forward. So I uh, want to say thank you to them. Um, and remember, you know, uh, if you want to support us out there and you want to join us through uh, Patreon and, you know, look at some of the other stuff, uh, just follow the link through um, and, you uh, you know, we're on there answering stuff, posting new bits. Um, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, we're having discussions about lots of stuff as well. Yeah. So with references, yeah, lots of follow up for today too. Yeah. References and things, guys. Um, what we're going to do is if we do mention any references, we'll try and uh, get those up onto Patreon so that you've got a permanent record, uh, not just, you know, having to go down through a, a zillion uh, posts on Facebook. I think it's going to be much more, it's going to be a better, a better curated place for having references. Bren, what do you think? Yeah, yeah it is a lot easier. And uh, uh, just in case you guys are wondering what's happened, uh, Connor started on a rant, and I think BT cut the line over the, north, <laughs> over the Irish Sea. The, <laughs> the Irish SAS moved in and cut the lines <laughs> before he could start a rant. We're not joking. Big farmer might have cut its feelers out. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want a, a, a collapse or a run on the uh, vaccine manufacturers so uh, the SAS was sent or whatever they call them were sent in <laughs> <He's here. laughs> oh, oh, no, he's managed to... got it in for you <laughs> my laptop lads I, I'm going to throw it out the window seriously it's, something's very very wrong with it anyway oh, we're back um it's we, very thought, sick. we thought you'd been taken out by the pharmaceutical industry. Zoetis, <laughs> <laughs> a Zoetis a arrow. <laughs> um, so where were we, guys? We're going to have, we're have a run. Paleo. We've done everything. Oh, we've done everything. Oh, done paleo. That's great. Okay, so like... Light the fuse. Yeah, here we go. So like, you know, let's get straight into the vaccination thing because uh, it's going to be a long one. So I just wanted to bring up a couple of little bits as, an, as the non-vet of the gang and say what kind of gets our goats a little bit. But uh, here's a great one from Fortune Business Insights. Uh, veterinary animal vaccine market, 9.75 billion in 2016, uh, in 2018. And just seven years later, by 2025, it's expected to be $16 billion. Uh, so it's increasing by about 70% in about six years. So vaccines are, uh, are, are a very lucrative market at the moment. But here's the, here's the facts on pets, okay? In 1997, a meeting of over 500 experts in the vaccination field occurred, the first symposium of veterinary vaccines and diagnostics. Based on the available evidence at that time, it was agreed that boosters should be given no more than once every three years. That was uh, 23, 24 years ago. Um, about four years later, later moves on working on behalf of Pfizer, so they are getting their, their results themselves, studied 322 client-on dogs, and uh, they found that in most dogs, vaccination induced a response that lasted up to and beyond four full years uh, for all five antigens tested. Results suggest that revaccination with the same vaccine provides adequate protection, even when given less frequently than the traditional one-year interval. Uh, and remember, this is uh, 
yeah. core vaccines. And for, you know, we've posted on Facebook about WSAVA guidelines uh, across the world. Um, and even BSAVA, the British Small Animal Veterinary Association in the UK, I still look at the core vaccines as distemper, infectious hepatitis and parvovirus. OK, yeah. uh, those are the ones which will last that long and yeah. longer. In fact, we're going to discuss got, yeah. how long yeah. they We're, we're just saying here that they actually have, since 2008, challenge studies of seven years. Now we've got challenge studies of nine years that they last beyond nine yeah. years. And Schultz, to quote Schultz, who's the boss man in all this, uh, like since 2008, we've known they've lasted seven years. With, with challenge studies. So they tried to give the animal the the the, the, the infection. But uh, to quote Schultz in 2006, revaccination fails to stimulate a secondary response as a result of interference by existing antibodies. A practice that was started many years ago that lacks scientific validity or verification is annual revaccinations. Almost yeah. without exception, there is no immunological requirement for annual revaccination. Immunity to virus persists unless you're talking about bacteria. So what I just wanted to point out was that like, this move to re-vaccinate annual, like re-vaccinate annually, like there's, there's not a sign, there's no study I can find out there that indicates vaccines wear off after a year for these core viruses. So that's that's we'll talk about this a bit more. Remember, you talked about except for the bacteriology ones, and that's the lepto. lepto yeah, that's the, the, the those, but, around lepto. But, but, for, we'll talk about that yeah, in, but yeah. for for puppies adequately vaccinated for viruses, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. The proper schedule has been done for viruses, which is the majority of the uh, vaccines that you give them. We know that they last. And so this idea of annual boosting, is it true that they just some vaccine manufacturer had the idea to say good for a year on the back of the packet and the veterinary community leaked? That's, what, what, ha that's what happened in the old days. But then in, in the early noughties, a group, I'd like to think that Brendan and I were part of it, a group of homeopathic vets got together with... Um, uh the, the canine health concern Catherine O'Driscoll who pushed this and I think we were influential in going from uh PhD and lepto every single year to PhD every three years and and which is fantastic yeah that's reduced mm -hmm. the amount of insult to the, the body by three however the the, the guidelines say that three years is the most frequent that, that you should give the PhD vaccines. It doesn't say give it every three years. It says three years is the maximum. It could be four, it could be five, it could be seven, it could be nine. I and must say we're going to talk practice. about immunity, immunity checks later on in this. Uh, yeah, you can do a teeter test. I think, I think I was kind of just getting cross about the fact that here's just another example. If we compare like cereal-based dry food, there isn't a head-to-head -head study that would ever convince you that it might be a good idea over well-made yes. raw dog food yeah. so yeah. is this just, is this just another example of an evidence-based you know scientific no, i think it started off with dogma of you know because of what happened in the very early days when the vaccines first came out and you know they were relatively poor and they have been improving over time um, you know, they were worried about, well, how long do they last? Well, this seems to work if we do it on an annual basis. I mean, look, some of the vaccines were reported at down at, you know, 40 to 50 percent when we first started giving Parvo vaccines okay. in the you know early 80s or well, late 70s, early 80s. You know, that's the sort of rates at which you were getting, you know, um, effectiveness. Uh, as in it was seeming to cover that number of dogs they were getting an immune okay. response. Yeah. They've obviously improved massively since yeah. then. I mean, you know, some of them will quote 95% on a single shot, you know, will be yeah. covered, you know, within two weeks. Yeah. So that's... Yeah. That's so that explains, I suppose, a bit of the hangover maybe from, from back in the day for, for guys that were practicing maybe, you know, 30, 40 years ago. What about like, you know... Um, anyway, look, I just want to, I think maybe is, is a bit of it that they believe that there's no side effects to it. If I just wanted to read, like, there is side effects to over-vaccinating pets. I mean, surely you, 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 we all know this. I mean, we've known since 1999, it explains up to 26% of immune-mediated hemolytic anemia, which is one of popular autoimmune diseases in dogs. It's linked to hypothyroidism. Um, so Moncrief found in 2002 that the vaccination of pet and research dogs for rabies induced the production of anti-thyroglobulin autoantibodies, a crucial finding with implications for the subsequent development of hyperthyroidism, as well as encephalitis, jaundice, organ failure, collapse, cancer, autoagulated red blood cells. So we know the side effects, and more worrying is the timeline of these side effects for these heavier, more chronic diseases. 
it's not like a vaccine goes in and your dog just turns belly up with his feet in the air, okay, like a cartoon character. Like authors uh, Dodds and Giger uh, state delayed type immunological responses can take 10 to 28 days to set in in dogs. The onset of any autoimmune diseases takes 30 to 45 days post-vaccination. There is no way on earth a conventional vet is going to attribute that po that autoimmune issue in my pet 45 days later with uh, you know the jab he got a while ago. Um, Absolutely right. But that's the beauty of the SARS stuff, okay? The more people have a reaction and they look at their vaccine records and they state whether they've had that and they include it in the reaction forms. And I posted earlier this year and we can raise that one to the top uh, so that people know how to report this stuff. A vet doesn't have to report it. It can be anybody. It can be years down the line. So if your yeah. dog has been suffering with um, immune-mediated hemolytic anemia and you know that they were vaccinated in early stages um, before you were, your dog was diagnosed and then you've stopped, you can still report it five years later. OK, mm. so you should go on that site and you should write down, did you know my dog had these vaccines and it had this disease? And you should go out there. And will, that, um, will, those, will those numbers count? Will this, what you're yeah. talking about, when we, we'll put up a link to the website after this, will those numbers count towards vaccine side effects that we read so, about? So they limited, they limited initially uh, to a three-week post-administration of a medicine. Um, there have been complaints and they said they would continue to monitor. So what happens is the more complaints that come in, that there's, they feel that it should be attributed to that thing. Even if it's six weeks, 12 weeks, 12 years on, you know, they they need to have the number of reports to say they can look at stats. Okay. If there's only one or two reports coming in, there's no way they can draw any conclusions from it. Right. So I would just implore all of you guys, you know, if any of you've had experience, you should report it. It's not a I know it's this. It's a I suspect, I suspect yeah. that there was adverse a adverse reaction. It's a suspected yeah. okay. adverse reaction, and you can suspect it just as much as your vet can suspect it, or a vet nurse or whoever can suspect it. Yeah. You just go to the VMD website. And follow your nose. It's, yeah, it's we'll, bring it up, yeah, we'll bring it up to the top. Um, we'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just I'll finish on this. Regarding on who's most effective, um, so I, I'm I'm pretty staggered at this. I want to see if it's true, guys. Uh, toy dogs are, are way more effective than any other dog. The smaller the dog, the more likely you are to have a vaccine reaction. Uh, is it true that there's no range of doses for vaccines in dogs of different sizes? Like, is, is a Great Dane going to get the same jab as a Palm? I mean, is all the same amount of juvent that's suitable for a Dane going into a palm? I mean, yeah, that's already yeah. what... So this is the, the thing. The, the amount of virus, okay, and the, the, the need for stimulating an immune response, because that is a really small part of the vaccine. And if anything, I think somebody's already commented, it would be the cleaner part of the vaccine. Um, it's the other stuff that they stick in to irritate the immune system that's more dose-dependent. Uh, the thiamersols, the um, you know, many of them say they washed out of the vaccines now, but it's still yeah. there. Yeah. Um, there's Chicken adjuvants serum. like aluminium hydroxide that goes in there. Uh, there's protein levels. So, you know, you wonder about, you know, we talk about foods a lot. And we talk about food sensitivities. We talk about sensitivity to beef. Well, the number of things that have beef albumin in them um, within this to grow those that virus on or to, to be part of what's going on all the way through to uh, in the bacterial parts of the vaccines, which we'll talk about, um, all the way through to the egg, which is part of what they're growing the viruses on, um, can often be contained within those vaccines. And that's the components that we get more concerned about in many cases than necessarily the viruses themselves. I the World Small Animal Veterinary Association actually say that that the bacterial vaccines, uh, specifically leptospirosis, has a worse record for adverse reactions. And it's pretty well recognized now that the lepto 4, the new lepto, has an even worse record. Uh, Reputation. Yeah. Reputation. Thank you, Connor. Then the, the Lepto 2, which is the old one. Yeah, it covered for two strains. The new one covers for four strains. And it's considered, uh, it, it, they actually say in, in the World Small Animal Veterinary Association guidelines, 2017, they say that you should avoid vaccinating toy breeds with 
the lepto vaccine. They actually say that. And, oh, and, and yeah, they actually say that. Oh. That's one thing. But what about vaccinating a toy puppy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, 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 it, it, it. So and breeders are doing it now as a matter of course. So uh, we're going to come back to the leptospirosis thing, Nick, because you've got you've yeah, got I've got lots of so I want to learn. I want to learn about it. But um, the idea of like we're now just getting puppies where breeders just lash in the the vaccination because it's no harm, isn't it? You know, it's only a, it's only a little bit, and it's this idea that no harm. You know, that's the, yeah. whole, it's the whole. There's no side effects to it. It's so casually accepted. It's so what if we annually boost? So what if it, you know brings a client in, they get a health check? Well, it's like no, because there's side effects to these boosters. Yeah. They don't need that kick in the immunological stones every year. You know, it's, it's if, not yeah. If you vaccinate a healthy. Uh, uh, animal who has had the vaccine last year and brendan was alluding to this no for you uh it, it has no effect yeah it's like if you go to the garage with a full tank of petrol in your car you can't fill it any further yeah. and that's exactly the the, the same yeah. analogy so 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 and you are even every three years if you've got good antibodies and you give the same vaccine it's just going to get 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 eaten up by the antibodies and will have zero effect and this was known 30 years ago professor hal thompson at glasgow university was saying this 30 years ago That's no nuts. relation so what's the what can somebody give us some advice now what do we what's next who's up next i mean can we can, what do we I do well, gonna go. well i wanted to ask you actually connor because uh, a lot of the this new craze for early vaccines you know with the, ah, the, the socialization the, the, the yeah. issue that i have with it you know of people banging in vaccines at six weeks of age what on earth you know is actually pointed at these people that deal with behavior connor yeah <laughs> uh and you know talk about early socialization and situation yeah. and stuff like that and i know you worked for an organization a long time ago that yeah. was getting puppies out on streets and trying to get them socialized eight, eight weeks old, so, yeah. So tell me, tell me what, you know, where are the studies these days that really mean that we should be doing that? Who, um, uh, studies, uh, I'm not sure, but I know that when we were in guide dogs, like, it, like I was the pup supervisor in there, we had to get those pups on the streets at eight weeks old. And we, for, first of all, everybody knew that maternal antibodies last. And that's why you don't start your, your vaccination schedule for a little bit after that. I mean, you're going to give us the when to do it and that kind of yeah. stuff later. But I do believe some of the lads are pushing it way back. You know, Schultz is at 15, 16 weeks before he starts off. And this gives co conventional vets a, a, a dilemma because they see that eight week to 16 week period of people walking around with their dogs and as, as a time to pick up uh, um, diseases. But the point is, if you, you're living with that dog for the next 16, 20 years, he's got to be socialized properly. It's your duty to socialize him because that's a huge part of his health. He's got to understand the buses and air brakes in the face aren't scary and big dogs barking and different people. And so it's called the imprinting period and it wears off very quickly. They're around 16 to 20 weeks, depending. You know, I'm sure the science is moving along since I was told this. So by 16 weeks, the imprinting period is snapping shut. So you, if you want a dog to be okay with trains, buses, they've got to see that four, five, six times very positively. Out in the streets, meeting other dogs, this stuff is normal, and they learn their, their licks very, very young, and they remember them as well. So you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can, but it's like teaching granny how to use a laptop or your two-year-old, you know. They, so there is a they, you can change things later, but this socialization period for behaviorists is, is so critical. So you have to get the dogs out in the streets. Keeping them wrapped up inside your house is not in the dog's best interest, except in terms of picking up diseases. So this is where I would come in and say, look, there's a difference between socialization and habituation. Yeah. Uh, and habituation you can do for, you know, we've done this for years now. We've delayed vaccines. We get them to 16 to 20 weeks before they get vaccinated. Uh, mm. But we'll talk about how to do that in a moment. Mm. Um, you know, if we at all can persuade people to do that, that's where we will go. Uh, but we have some people that go early and you just got to say look you can lift these little puppies yeah you know uh you can you know the viruses don't jump the yeah. viruses are going to be caught through them getting it on their paws or face to face yeah you know, corners the dogs. up on um, walls lampposts like having or your shoes yeah you know so you letting your shoes be chewed by your puppy because you couldn't be bothered to take them off at the door and you've just left them in the house you know those are the places that they're going to pick up you know virus if you're in a heavily infested area um you know so city centers you know heavy populations of dogs uh those sort of areas um then you're more at risk 
if you are like Nick out in the countryside in leafy suburbs, you know, beautiful surroundings, you know, one dog every three miles, you know, and you don't need to give, um, you know, the level of protection that early on, you know, you've got woodland, you know, woodland floor, great yeah. for stimulating the immune system. Yeah, this is the whole thing about, you know, where they get their immunity, their challenges from. Yeah. So, you know, you've got to look at coming back for a moment, you, you can lift these dogs, you can get over shoulder bags, you can get the little hand cart trolleys, you know, push chairs, those sort of things. Mm -hmm. You can get them to experience these noises without necessarily the risks uh, that's going yeah. on. There. I, will, I go one, for, one further than that. I will say to them that I would like them to go to 16 weeks before they have the, the vaccine. And at my practice, we only do parvo alone. We don't do lepto. We don't do distemper and hepatitis. But that's that's perhaps another story we can discuss. But what I do say is it's your obligation. After we talk about the pros and cons of vaccinating early and late and no sodes and not and no vaccination whatsoever, we talk about all that stuff. But the important thing is that your job is to expose that puppy to as much of life as possible but not in doggy areas yeah. you get disease from doggy areas so mm. the beach is is generally fine because it's washed twice a a, a day um you go to places in the woods where no other in people the take their dogs yeah. you go mm -hmm. to plowed fields you go off yeah. the beaten track and i think that as long as you realize that you're not playing the game that the manufacturer would like you to play, i.e. we will guarantee if you do it our way, we will guarantee you'll be okay, which mm. we can't do, by the way. Exactly. And that's what we do. So you socialize the dog as much as possible in your garden, in your friend's gardens, in your friend's houses. You can walk the dog in the middle of the street, but keep his nose away from dirty, like the walls where the leaves blow. We were told to avoid any clumps of leaves because that's where the wind blows and lampposts. So you can mm. walk in the States, have a lot of dogs around, but you can still put your dog down if he's on his own and walk down a path as long as he's not, you know, licking dirty ditches and stuff. And if, as Ben says, as if, if, if chaos is up ahead, you pick your dog up and... Um, you can have you can have really vaccinated dogs. Why couldn't you socialise with vaccinated dogs in your back garden? I mean, I honestly, you can. yeah, yeah, no, they absolutely say yeah, it does. Yeah, it does say in the guidelines actually. Uh, look, as long as you know they're vaccinated dogs, yeah, and they're healthy, or yeah. they're not poorly, because even yeah. if they're vaccinated, if they're poorly, they can carry all sorts of stuff. Yeah, so it's the and point of shedding guys. individuals. What, so what about shedding? I mean, kennel cough vaccine in inverted commas, you're a shedder after that. So, what about the rest of the jobs? Could you do you shed after yeah, any of the remember, jobs? Yeah, let's talk about that for a moment. If you're shedding kennel cough vaccine, okay, you're actually shedding pig bordetella, then you're going to get a rel you're not shedding a canine bordetella. Ah, so you're not, not actually getting the border teller issue. You're just vaccinating the other dogs around you no with or sign border teller. They or may get tweet. a cough for two or three days, but it's not going to be a honking cough for six months. So okay? vaccinated, a kennel cough, a border teller vaccinated dog can't spread border teller in kennels. It can only spread the, the vaccine strain. It can't. It's not picking up a different um, vaccine. I, I thought know, that was true. See, there teller. you go. That's doesn't a doesn't convert to, you know, it's the pig border teller that they've got. The issues that you've got is that too many people think that border teller is the only part of the kennel cough <laughs> complex. <laughs> there is about 20 different viruses and bacteria from pasteurellas through to, you know, parainfluenzas, you know, influenzas, all sorts of minor viruses, even coronaviruses that can actually cause coughs in your dog. So, you can't assume what you're doing is you're vaccinating against whooping cough, okay? The one that makes those dogs and children, okay, uh, for the for the human version, cough and cough and cough and can't sleep and they tired out and it's a repeatable horrible cough, okay? It's devastating. It's really rare, okay? It is really rare to come across a true border teller kennel cough. Mm. Okay. However, if you had to choose one of the vaccines, I think that the kennel cough would be the least uh, noxious of all of them because it yeah. does go where it's supposed to go. Whereas yeah, through the membrane, it's supposed to get parvo and distemper through here, but we then shove it in here. And yeah. so that, there's going to be some confusion That's with the point, TNT yeah. helper cell Although, and all this kind of Nick, stuff. So, I have to disappoint you. They've brought out yes. an injectable version. Ah. 
Thank God. Goodness. Which Thank is goodness. no, it's devastating. I know. I can add to it. I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> because dogs don't like it at their noses and they don't want to disappoint their clients. Yeah. That's what it is. I always yeah. used to just get them to open their mouths and fire it at the back. In fact, I got that from John Saxton. Yeah, yeah well, doesn't the <laughs> guidelines say that the... Uh, their eye. used to do all sorts to get around putting it up their noses. Doesn't the Wasava guidelines say that it doesn't lend itself to vaccination? That disease doesn't lend itself to vaccination. Yeah, because, uh, yeah. because worldwide there was an injectable form, but it's really, really poorly... Um, Again, it's one of these vaccines that's, you know, when you give it, it only really covers a very low number of dogs if you inject it. And worldwide, there was, there's been an injectable available for about 20 plus years. Um, and uh, it's just, we've never used it in the UK. We've always used the intranasal one, which is far more effective. Um, but just there's never been really a consistent understanding of you you know, it's like taking the, the whooping cough vaccine for children and expecting it to cover against all coughs that yeah. that child will ever get from school. You know, yeah, that would be laughable. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, can, can I ask you? It might just what? be that they only get a seven-day cough, which yeah. we don't care about. Guys, can I ask you uh, what you have vaccinated your dogs with and why? Uh, Connor? Uh, Dudley's seven now. He got vaccinated uh, twice as a pup, I think. Uh, honestly, God, I can barely remember, so good question, but it was definitely the most he got was three and one because you struggle to find. Like, honestly, God, if it was my choice, I'd put in Parvo, and that's it, in my opinion. Yeah. But I'm not yeah. a vet, but I can have a say it's my dog, and I'd probably just put in Parvo. I don't see a, 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 a point to the rest of them. But um, Parvo virus, I got three and one was the minimum I could get, and I got it either once or twice. I can't remember. Nothing since. I haven't tied or tested. I haven't looked under the bonnet. I'm just assuming it's worked, but that's a little bit sloppy, so I wouldn't be giving, taking my advice. Cool. Bren, where so, did you go? Yeah, so this is interesting because we've done 25 years of taking titer tests and vaccine checks and stuff like that. So yeah. I do see the viruses that are naturally stimulating because we've got dogs that don't get vaccinated. They just get exposed. And so, and you will tell the difference when you're doing a virus neutralizing antibody test, a tighter test, the more expensive one costs over a hundred quid usually. Um, and and it's, it's, you know, that's the lab costs for, for doing these now um, for distemper, hepatitis, parvo. And you can see them go up into the 20,000s and you get 20,000 for infectious hepatitis. You know, that's a wild type virus that stimulated your dog. And I've had that for my own dogs. Um, but fortunately, my protocol has always been vaccinate as late as possible. I mean, for, for Artie, you've seen my spaniel around on various pictures and stuff. Uh, she didn't get vaccinated till 20 weeks. Um, a single shot, a single shot of distemper hepatitis parvo was enough to give her cover at that point. Um, I took her into woodlands. I was out, out in the remote stuff um, and everything else. Single shot of that has covered her, and she gets now vaxi checked, and she's still immune. However, mm -hmm. lepto is a different story. Yeah. Now there is, um, we do see lepto coming into the practice. We get a lot of referrals. Um, I was saying to these guys earlier um, uh, this evening just about the fact that look. You've got to understand there's about 25 different serovars, and I'm not going to steal too much of Nick's thunder, but there's about 25 serovars that can cause disease in dogs in the UK. Uh, strains, different strains. Uh, different strains. There are about 250 total leptos, you know, huge numbers out there, um, some of which might cause things, you know, they're even investigating things like the um, you know, Alabama rot and things like that as to whether they're connected to these, these serovars and, mm. and stuff some strange so i have uh definitively just said look i know that where they go in the lakes it's a risk assessment thing if i had have a little toy dog that stayed in my arms and on the sofa next to me then i wouldn't vaccinate them any more than i would vaccinate my daughters okay against lepto if i've got an arty who she is in every puddle that's an inch deep She's in the water trough. She's, you know, of every single, you know, uh, uh, cattle, whatever is going on. She would be in there. She chases rats. She eats rats and mice from the field, you know, all of that stuff. So she gets one. But I choose one that doesn't have an adjuvant in. 
It doesn't have um, thiomersal even in the making of the product. They actually, they these are the guys that I, I was talking to for 20 years about can they not do something about not using thiomersal? And just as we were looking at other vaccines, they brought out the one that doesn't have thiomersal in at all. Thiomersal is a mercury-based preservative, yeah. which they have removed from virtually every... They used it to kill the vaccine. vaccine. Yeah, to kill to kill the bacteria so they're no longer alive, um, and and it also acts as a preservative to some degree because it's an antibacterial. But it's a horrible one. You wouldn't do that. You know. mm. But if you smash the bottle, you're supposed to get the hazmat team in to yeah. uh, to clean the console it's room. It's only out. a little bit, guys. It's only a little bit they're injecting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but okay, they so lots of times, Artie, Artie gets a lepto and your Labrador. Yeah, yeah. So she does too, because she's the same. They're both water okay. babes. They both will drink okay. from from everything. But I use that that particular uh, one. And what's the what's what's the vaccine? Spill the beans. So that's the Urican L Multi. Okay. Urican E U R I C A N. Would you be able to write it up on Maybe the we'll phone? We'll post it after yeah, yeah. the show, guys. We'll post. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, now uh, you Connor, will have to ask for these separately. Okay, because not that many um, vets will even think about this as an issue. They well, just in for us. Hmm. And we we stock um, three different lepto options because we have a full range of people that will come in and demand that they have you know those. We try and persuade them in most cases not to even have it unless they absolutely need it. But you must understand, guys, it's all about an individual risk assessment. You know, and I, you've can, got to look at what your relative risk is. Can I ask a question about risk, good Brent? It's just why we're on this. And Nick, we need to find out what you vaccinate your dogs. Yeah, do what I do. Um, yeah. So, so Brent, tell me this, all right? How many dogs have you had through your clinic that have ne not been vaccinated for leptospirosis that got leptospirosis? Well, the problem is, I've also had dogs that are vaccinated against leptospirosis. Yeah, no, that's not that asking about that because we know we know but, most of the cases. You have, you know, it seems in this so, um Yeah, there'll be a lady who may be even watching tonight that her dog. We definitively chose not to vaccinate against leptospirosis, uh, yeah. but her dog got leptospirosis autumnalis. Okay which is not within the vaccine protocol anyway, but did get leptospirosis. Interesting. Okay. How, how, so, how widely, how, like, from a risk point of view, you're asking us to kind of go based on risk, but we've nobody to ask, because if you ask a conventional vet, <laughs> what's the risk of eating bones? Jesus, it's lethal, it's going to kill them. So that's no risk that I'm going to go by. So I, I fear that if I ask a conventional vet, what's the risk of any disease? There, there's now at seven and one, they believe that those other six diseases are just so prevalent. If you don't take the vaccination, your dog's going to die. I don't agree with that. So think, what's yeah, it, I think we really have to say distemper is quite rare in the UK, like very rare in the UK, and hepatitis is not that common in the, the UK. Downside the downside is the Romanian imports, Nick, for distemper, um, huge, huge. I've got two Romanian vets work with us. They know it's a huge problem out there. Right. I have seen it in Romanian imports. Uh, you know, for the first time in 20 years, the yeah. last one I saw uh, was actually in a, a vet's down south uh, that had seizure problems. And I thought, you know, it was pretty much dead and buried, you know, uh, as far as a disease that we would consider a problem. And yet we are getting so many imports now where actually we're reintroducing the prevalence of these viruses back into the country. But how prevalent is it? Romanian imports is fairly small. Yeah, yeah no, no, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's got to be so that people are aware of it. Yeah. So, Brennan, um, dogs okay. not vaccinated for leptospirosis to get leptospirosis, it's not exactly, I wonder, is that an annual occurrence? But you see one dog a year, you've got a big, I would busy say vet. We probably, yeah, we probably only get about um, two to three out of uh, 5,000 dogs that, that get um, leptospirosis, get but most of them are vaccinated for leptospirosis, I'd warrant. That's my bet. Are they vaccinated or not, Brendan? Yeah, it's the not vaccinated ones I'm after. Yeah, no, that's the, I would say that's the not vaccinated. Oh, so it does okay. happen. D um, but it's Connor. not a lot. You know, that's still a low prevalence, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. Connor, tell us about the, the Swiss study you were talking about, the, uh, the, uh, the lep I, lepto I, in the mountain. I, I can only find a very short kind of segment out of it, but it, it, it was much juicier than this. But here's what I have of it. Um, I was just talking about... Uh, 
Yeah, Major Adal, 2014 is the study, Nick, okay? But this is only my notes from it. I don't know where I found yeah. it. Well. Investigated a minor outbreak of leptospirosis in Bern, Switzerland. They focused on a single veterinary hospital in where, uh, where 298 dogs were found to have contacted leptospirosis over 10 years. Vaccination history was available for 250 of these dogs, which is 84%. Of these, 96% have been adequately vaccinated against leptospirosis. Mm. Uh, that's in a country that is like, you know, 50-50 on whether they... Um, but there was more to that study. I can't remember what the rest of that study was. But Canine Health Concern in 1997 post-vaccination survey, 3,800 candidates, uh, and they found that leptospirosis, if your dog got it, it happened within three months of a vaccination. 100% of cases within three months of a vaccination. You know, so... It, that should have been twenty five percent every three every quarter, but in fact, a hundred percent of cases happen within three months of the vaccination, which is really interesting. Uh, so that's all I know. I I kind of put that in the no way bubble, and but that's so dangerous because I like, I don't know how to believe anymore. Do you know? Mm. And then but at least and it's really it's hard because quite a lot of the uh, leptos will go under the radar, okay? Because the majority of cases you don't see anything for years because the kidneys don't just tip over and fail. They just trickle and it ticks along and then they end up with renal failure in older life oh. and you don't really know what the, the cause was because they're well beyond the infection, oh. um, you know. And so there's all sorts of elements that's insidious about that disease. Yeah. Uh, and that's a really difficult one. Look, in its own right, we do get, you know, the thing is I'm in a slightly different position because I also get referral work where I see some of these things and I've got a review. I get the wonderful torch of hindsight of looking at, you know, all of the stuff that the vets have done. And then I can sort of go, oh, why didn't they see this? And you sort of like, you suddenly do the tests and there you go, you, you can find these cases. So it's a little bit unfair for me to say that these guys are missing it, but many of them don't know the prevalence because they're not looking. And the, you know, and because it's not being looked at, even SAVSnet and things like that, which are looking for prevalence, aren't really finding this level. Um, there are some things that are brought out by the vaccine companies, but you always take that with a pinch of salt because that's what we should do as scientists. You know, if you've got somebody selling something to you and they come to you and say, you need this because I've got this little yeah. model of disease going on, you, you go, really? Um, yeah. You know, but that's... We are, there's no way we're going to get our, these, our subjects finished because Nick, no, you, 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 you right, want to okay. test about leptose uh, process and Brian wants to talk about tighter just testing. Think, yeah, just Who's one second. First? Heather Eden a very uh, 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 astutely says, I think all Romanian imports are vaccinated. And yet, Bren, you're saying that they're, they're seeing, or are they not vaccinated? I think most yeah. of them are. I think they will be vaccinated, but this is the whole issue of, you know, if you vaccinate an animal after it's already got the disease, uh, okay. it's not curative mm -hmm. and most of them are coming from rescue kennels so most of these are street dogs oh, okay yeah. uh that are then being rescued and brought across and vaccination does not stop them you know it doesn't cure yeah, them of the disease they already have in fact if you look at the data sheets of all the disease and most vaccines actually but all the all the veterinary vaccines that i know it does it says that it will reduce the symptoms of disease it doesn't say it will prevent disease oh, which i think is really that's interesting. important really really important um i'll tell you about bluebell and mouse so bluebell uh, is is now two years old she's a whippet uh, Italian greyhound, so she's slightly small, not not toy by any means. And she got, I gave her a single parvo shot at about 19 weeks and nothing else since, and that's it. Mouse, however, she's about 20, 22 weeks now, and I haven't yet given her the leptospirosis. And the reason is that I thought Bluebell was slightly itchy for her first six months or so and every time she itched i felt so yeah, guilty yeah, yeah. there may be no link but i but, felt but, very guilty you know, let's face it they're not really water dogs in the same way that oh, they're, in water. Is, they? they're in water and muck and grot all the time well you know it's like I, I live in a tiny little village and there's there's a farm at either end so there's a lot of mud in between yeah. so and we've got rats we've got rats under the shed we've got rats under the yeah. wood pile so uh, and I'm not definitely not giving leptospirosis. And you know, one of the things is if they do get leptospirosis, and we get get in early with if, with a suspected lepto, you can give an antibiotic. Yeah, doxycycline. 
you can get in with that and and sometimes that would uh uh help if you get in there early enough okay sure so there you go. That's, that's where I am. now 1939, and we do have to mention tire testing. We do need to give some yeah. advice here, and we do need to get to this leftosporosis. Uh, well, uh, okay. For yeah, all of those guys that asked great. about, um, yeah. all of those guys that asked about the um, the nosodes. Look, I've put a post on about the um, nosode situation. Um, so look on our Facebook page. That really pretty much deals with that. You've got to individualize it. Um, vaccine nosodes are not the same as disease nosodes. You've got to be very, uh, dis, you know, distinct about how you use those. Um, and you know, please talk to your holistic talk vet. To about those. Yeah. Okay. Any studies behind them, guys? Yes, there are. There are. And the book, actually, the book to read. There's one by a guy called Dr. Isaac Golden. Yeah. Dr. Isaac Golden, and it's called Vaccination Homeoprophylaxis. That's okay. a really interesting one to read. And there's another one. The uh, the Cuban leptospirosis study, 2012. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Disease nosodes. Nose. Just yeah. Google Google the hell out of that, and you'll get some good yeah. stuff on no, 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 on no. nosodes. If you talk to no, to your regular vet about nosodes, they will they will throw their hands up in the air. But I don't think it's quite as simple as that. And yeah. individual, as Brendan says, individualizing, I think is 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 the way to go yeah. there. And taking responsibility. Nothing is perfect. Let's yeah. Nothing is perfect. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's for sure. sure. So that's in there. Uh, so look, vaccine checks and, and titers. Um, you know, we've had some questions, um, some posts about you know what what those expenses the and different things like that. And remember, some of them will be prices with and without um, health checks. And depending where you are in the country, you know, the health check actually to me is the most important part about your visit. You know, you can just shelve the vaccine if you just said to them, "I want to consult." just so that we can just check about what my animal's doing, that would be what you should be doing, yeah. okay? That's probably more important than anything to do with the vaccination. But the same thing with the titers, you know, some will include the price of a, a consultation, some won't. Um, remember, if you go for a virus neutralizing antibody titer, which is much more detailed, much looking at not just the quantity of, antibody that's in there but the strength of reaction so how well it fits to the virus and neutralizes it Ooh. okay that is the more expensive test you go to biobest in edinburgh or glasgow university those are the two big labs most of the other labs will send it to one of those two to get that done and it generally costs um depending on how much discount and how many tests you're doing with those labs will cost between 90 and 120 pounds there for the in-depth in one that's the in depth one. one that's the posh, that's the posh one, one. Okay. The WSAV, wsava say that the vaccine check which is just like a pregnancy test a posh pregnancy test <laughs> is good enough it is industry standard yeah. how much is that so that uh, will work out depending, again, how many you do, because they come in groups of 12 yeah. tests together. Um, so if you're doing 12 dogs, and so we line up um, enough of 12 tests to do them all together ah. uh, so that it keeps the cost down. So it can be in the region of about, after that, £25 thereabouts to run each test. Um, but then you put the health check on or whatever you need to do. Mm -hmm. So that's the, um, the, the rough cost if you're just doing those. But remember... It's also about who's reading the tests and who's interpreting the tests because you can get anybody doing those. But if they've only been doing it for a week or they've been doing it for, you know, the odd cases. And as soon as one of them is maybe slightly on the, the pale side when it's reacting, because this is a semi quantitative test. It looks at basically um, the the. The color change, it's a, an immunoassay that looks at color change as to how many antibodies are in that system. Ah. Now, the reason the uh, WSAVA said, look, this is satisfactory is because they reckon with the amnestic response, if you've got antibodies circulating, they should be covered against these viruses. Because as soon as they get the virus, those cells will kick into producing more um, antibodies and therefore you should be able to cover. So the the thing that you really want to see is a series. The reason for repeating these, if maybe once a year or maybe more frequently, you know, they even talk on the diagram that we 
we put on the, one of the Facebook posts about testing after you've just done the vaccine. So maybe within six months of doing the vaccines is because if you can see that they've had a positive result on the vaccine check, and then you see one of them starts to fade off a bit, you can be fairly confident that they've got an amnestic response and maybe even a cellular immunity also ongoing. And therefore, you don't need to be panicking about the one thing that they've started to dip in. And it's understanding that just because one thing's low, if two other things are high and their immune system's working well and they've been exposed, then there is no need to suddenly go, oh my God, we've got to do everything all yeah, over it's again. not just about antibodies. Like you said, there's cellular immunity as well, which isn't measured. There is. So, so why you can't? It's, it's, too expensive. Off all. it's There's just no test out there for it. You know, the CD4 or CD8 counts, as we would always talk to them about, you know, when you're looking at things like HIV, you know, uh, status and stuff like that. You just can't do for these viruses. It's so expensive, you know, 300 quid and you might just scrape the barrel with that. Yes. Uh, Guys, simply, 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 simply speaking at 1945, yes. simply <laughs> speaking, you can do a test after you've vaccinated to check that the vaccine has actually done its job. You can do a test every year if you want, or if you have to show something to kennels, or you can do it every three years legitimately if you had reasonable antibodies. So it's either straight after, one year, or three years seems to be what okay. most people will do. So best advice for a puppy, uh, a puppy, we've just got a puppy, she's eight weeks old, when do we take them down to the vets, and what are we asking for? Take them down for a checkup. Yeah. Make sure that they uh, get used to the vets. You know, that's an experience that yeah. they need to, to have. OK, yeah. but state that to them that you're not going there for the vaccine on that. This is a checkup and a get used to and, a, and a, an explorer nice. of what you want to do with your puppy. Uh, and then look at, you know, the individual risks for where you are in your area. Um, try and get a prevalence of, of disease, you know, ear to the ground. Remember, too many people talk about parvo out there when it's actually hemorrhagic gastroenteritis okay there's lots of different bacterial diseases that can cause that you know yeah. diarrhea and sickness with blood um and unless it's absolutely proven with a test that this is parvo there are so many newspaper articles that go out there saying yeah. parvo's in the area I just thought it was horrible. And I've, seen, I've seen it it's devastating it's horrible mm. um yeah. Uh, so yeah. I actually thought it was just parvo so what so, age Bren are you starting Nick and what age are you guys starting if uh, well, actually, you've kind of told me what. Yeah, push them as late as possible. 16 yeah. weeks is what they advise. You know, WSA, so ABA would say 16 weeks, you only need a single shot yeah. of distemper yeah. hepatitis a parvo shot. to go for those. A single one shot, shot only. Of, three, of three and one. On license as a, well. A single shot of three and one at 16 weeks, yeah. and then a tighter test to see if it's taken and there's been no clash with the maternal antibodies. Yeah, and your, your obligation is to socialize them safely. Yes. Yeah, safety. 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 yeah so, safe socialization. That's a really key word there that was missing yeah. from that. Um, uh, there was something else that came up there a while ago. One of the questions about look, your your insurance companies. So we've got we've got a terrible over here in Ireland. It's a complete racket because we've only got a couple, and they they anyway. I shouldn't say too much about them, but uh, in the UK, so what you can do with the guys uh, with the insurance companies is that you can ring them, and if if it's in your policy, which is quite rare now, but sometimes it's in your policy that if your pet isn't vaccinated each year, your policy is null and void. So car crashes, so a kid runs out. Only against those viruses? No, some policies, I'm telling you, Brian, against a website insurance company, I've just pretty much told you who it is. Uh, <laughs> certainly, certainly a couple of years ago, your policy was null and void. So claims weren't being made based on vaccination schedules because you haven't seen the... Perhaps that's part of the annual checkup that we didn't... Do. Anyway, look, it, the point is, if you're worried about your vaccinations, you simply ring the insurance company and you, if that is a, a requirement of theirs, you can get that disease written out of your insurance policy, which is an option should you want to stay with such a company. Um, but that that is where it starts to fall down because insurance companies are demanding annual vaccination. Yeah, well, we, we had an argument with them about this because actually the, uh, well, it's also now three years anyway for most of those, but it was only about the viruses so that they if they weren't vaccinated at all and you didn't tie to test and you couldn't prove immunity or anything like that then they excluded the um those virus hepatitis parvo if they came down and it was proven that those were the things and you had ignored that yeah they wouldn't cover for that treatment that, that's fair enough however mm -hmm. what they have pushed that back to now is if you can prove immunity they should be covered okay, okay. for whatever but it is also written into most of these policies 
that there is an annual health check done to rule out if there's any ongoing disease or other disease yeah. because many of those yeah. companies are reliant on looking at that history to see has this disease been going on should it have been written okay. out as an exclusion or not um, and that's what it is so it's actually about the annual health check which okay. is a really important bit okay could you recommend an annual health check yeah totally and so does the wsava guys okay. i think we should do another one on vaccines for all the stuff that we haven't talked about in about a month's time what do you reckon yeah yeah the adult it's stuff just, i think definitely. it's a great topic yeah. it's a great and it's really juicy yeah okay yeah. so let's 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 think about that what are we doing next too. week what are we doing next week uh we had already we already knew what we were doing i can't remember what it is now oh, oh, <laughs> uh, carbs you you asked for carbs on patreon oh carbs. yes Yes, carbs yes, and yes, yes, yeah, did. absolutely. Yes, That's a uh, huge yes, topic. Yes. There's one that needs that needs a part one, two, and three. That does. Okay, we'll do. We will do the essence of carbs in seven days. <laughs> the yeah? essence of carbs. The yes. essence. The yes, flowery language. We will distill. We will distill like a fine whiskey. <laughs> the 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 elixir yeah. of life out of carbs and deliver that to you. And I give you some references on Patreon. Somebody was saying that they don't understand Patreon. Basically, everybody gets together, puts a few quid. They just say, I'm going to give Plus you a few coffee, quid, whatever. A few quid every month. That's it. And if yeah. you could pay three quid, that's like a cup of coffee. So I forget about the coffee. The on here and, uh, it, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It's just everybody, just so that we can, we can uh, get somebody to help us with our admin because we're getting pretty overwhelmed with our admin. That's yeah. really all it is. It's just you're helping us to give you content because yeah. we want that's what we want to do. And thanks again to Paleo Ridge there, paleoridge.co.uk. Um, they're fantastic. They've been very good just for the last few months and uh, sponsors yeah. again tonight. So check them out on their on their new website. Um, so that's it, guys. Look, you send your questions. Or we'll get your questions on uh, patreon.com yeah. forward slash yeah. pet medics. And uh, as always, uh, thanks for being here. I just love it. I just love doing this. It's great. It's and, great. Uh, it's I'm going fun. downstairs to to uh, to put two kids to bed. So it's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> always. Right. Guys, oh, thanks for giving us your top one, Connor. Yeah, that's great. Cheers, Absolutely guys. Very good. Thank you. Thank you to everyone out there. Speak to you soon. Bye bye. Keep waving, Nick. <laughs>